Hello, good afternoon, good morning to all of you that are tuning in across the Atlantic. Uh, my name is Suda David Wilp, and on behalf of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, I'd like to welcome you to our series on uh, choices for Germany after Merkel. This is the second discussion that we're running in our series, and we're going to talk about Germany's role in the world. Um, it's great to have you all with us. We've got a great panel representing different parties uh, in the German Bundestag. And I'm going to have a short conversation with each of our panelists, um, and then I will open up to Q&A so all of you can pose questions. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and the questions will automatically queue up, and I will get to them very shortly. So um, let me first start with a brief round of introductions. We're really pleased to have Niels Annen with us today. Uh, Niels is a member of the Social Democratic Party, and he is also a Minister of State in the German Federal Foreign Ministry. He has um, extensive foreign policy experience. He was previously the chairman of the SPD's Commission on International Politics. We also have Franziska Brantner with us today, who is a member of Bundes 90 Die Grünen, the Greens. She's a spokesperson for European policy, as well as the parliamentary secretary of um, the Green Parliamentary Group in Bundestag. And uh, previously, from 2009 to 2013, she served in the European Parliament in Brussels. We also have Gita Jensen with us, who is a member of the Free Democratic Party, the FDP, and she's chairwoman of the Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid. She was just appointed also into uh, as a new member of the FDP's leadership at um, the party's convention last weekend. And if I'm not mistaken, she's also currently the youngest member, female member of the Bundestag. We also have Andreas Nick. Uh, Andreas Nick is a member of the Conservative Party, the CDU. Uh, prior to serving in government, he worked in uh, finance and corporate finance and uh, in the Bundestag. He is the um, in the parliamentary assembly, the German delegate to the Council of Europe and is also the ranking member for the CDU uh, for the subcommittee on the UN. So welcome all of you. Thanks for uh, being here with with us. What I'd like to do is to start off with a general question uh, to all of you, and I'd love for you to keep your comments to maybe two to three minutes so we can go up, go around and hear from all of you. And then I'll ask some individual questions pertaining to your party stances on different issues. And as I mentioned before, I'll open it up to Q&A. And I guess we should really start off with the topic of Nord Stream 2. Um, Axios reported late last night uh, that President Biden is looking to waive certain sanctions on Nord Stream 2. Uh, what do you think is the calculation there um, with this move with President Biden, considering the bipartisan stance on Russia uh, in Washington, D.C., as well as I'm sure most of you listened to President Biden's speech at the MSC. Um, he clearly uh, talked about Russia as a revisionist power. And on that note, let's also bring China into this, because it seems like Germany is always struggling um, looking at China and Russia with a sort of a military or geopolitical lens, rather the um, economic lens outweighs um, the other sub other other area. So Niels, why don't we start with you? Yeah, Suda, thank you very much. It's great uh, to have you and um, uh, greetings to my colleagues here on the panel. I try to um, follow um, your request to be brief. First of all, I think it's a good um, positive message that we are hearing from Washington. If confirmed that uh, it, it looks like uh, we are getting a waiver and which means translated in political language that there will be more time to discuss uh, issues related to Nord Stream 2. We have a difference of view and it's quite, I think, still quite fundamental because we don't accept um, what we consider to be illegal um, extraterritorial sanctions. And I also believe it's important for our American friends also to understand that this is a question of sovereignty. And I always ask my, my American colleagues what they would think about the German or the European parliament passing a law protecting American energy security by threatening, sanctioning, let's say, people who work uh, in the um, fracking business or nuclear business. But, um, but I, I, I believe it, it gives us some time. And the core of the matter is that, you know, um, we should and we must coordinate our policies towards Russia and China in a more comprehensive way. Uh, especially China will be the challenge of the decade. And so um, my understanding is that 
it makes more sense to talk about these issues instead of sanctioning your own allies and friends. And with that spirit, uh, I, I'm a little more optimistic, although it's only a waiver, which means that uh, it can be changed from one day to another. And, and so there's still work to do, but uh, you see me looking a little more optimistic. Uh, and I, I, my interpretation, quite frankly, is that of sending a message um, that the you <clears throat> Biden administration is not intending, you know, um, to harm a, a central transatlantic relation with the key partner. Uh, and, and so let's work with that and let's see what the future will bring. But I think it's, it's a good message coming from the Atlantic. Francisca, I'd like to go over to you next, uh, not just because we're going to do alphabetical order, but also because the Greens have a very different view on this matter. Um, you know, Annalena Baerbock, your Spitzenkandidat, your Chancellor candidate for the Greens, has come out quite strongly against this project. Um, it could be that Biden is buying more time and also offering a sort of an off ramp to an important ally. But what about Ukraine and what about um, countries in NATO on the eastern flank? What does it mean for also for Europe's energy security? Yeah, thank you for the question and hi to everybody. Um, we have been opposing Nord Stream 2 way before uh, President Trump publicly did or before the US sanctions because we believe it's not in the European interest. Uh, it goes against the interest of our, our European partners in the East and the North. Um, it also ran really against all our climate goals. Um, and it is a prestige uh, project by Putin. Uh, and it's the clique around him, the corrupt one that is benefiting from it. So we really don't see any interest in this project. Um, and if I may add, of course, we have been opposing the sanctions, the US sanctions for the reason Niels correctly mentioned, because I think it's not the way to deal among partners, but we thought that it would have been a great opportunity with the new transatlantic opening with the President Biden elected uh, to get rid of this um, discord and for us in Germany to move ahead and um, invest in real new in energy in our European interest. So for us, it's a wrong project from beginning to, uh, to end, and we hope to be able to end it sooner than later. So if the Greens were to um, lead the next government, which is theoretically possible, do you see um, the project being put on ice? I mean, there's only like what, the last mile that's left before it goes online. Is this something that you're going, do you think your party members will want um, want when coalition talks take place after the election at the end of September? It certainly is important for us to withdraw the political support for the project. Um, this political support has to end. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's sort of like with the coal plants, you do support it financially, you subsidize it as a state. And then at the end to get them to stop it, you also have to pay them again, quite, ex it gets expensive again. So we already know that probably at the end, in the 10 years, 15 years, latest 20 years, we will have to pay again billions for the gas pipeline to stop. So we believe it's better to end it now than keeping it, protracting it um, and investing in the wrong sectors. Um, so, you know, it doesn't mean that we want to get uh, U.S. Fr fracking gas and liquefied gas. Let me be frank on this one, too, uh, if it's a transatlantic discussion. Um, we really want to become, um, you know, more reliable in terms of renewable sources. We also know that we have to create new energy partnerships with the African countries, with Middle Eastern countries. We will not be completely independent, but we want it to be more focused on renewables. And one more thing before I go to Gita, um, Francisca, can you talk a little bit about China? Do you see this also as a front where the Greens will also say like, let's have a new outlook on China compared to what's been happening over the last 16 years uh, between when it comes to relations between Germany and China? Yes, we have been criticizing the EU-China investment agreement. We have also been criticizing that there's 
not a step like the UK and others are doing um, to outlaw products uh, produced by slave labor uh, to be introduced in the European market. Um, so we are much more outspoken on Hong Kong, etc. We know that it will have an economic price. Um, we just want that German policy is looking or is defining less European interest by its car industry um, and rather by our European security interests. Um, and that's why we need to diversify imports and exports. And I think that will be a challenge that you don't get to tomorrow, but it's a process, diversification, imports, exports, it's a process. And one final point, we're very key on 5G to make it more secure. We have been outspoken against Huawei and really think we should support the European key players we still have, Ericsson, Nokia, um, and make our digital infrastructure safe. Thank you, Ida. I um, listened to some of you know, the reports and watched a little bit of the party convention that the FTP had over the weekend, and I was surprised to see that China was a topic of discussion, a very strident tone on China. Um, what, 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 what does the FTP think about um, you know, markets and also you know, having a strong economy, but also uh, when it comes setting a, sort of a red line when it comes to human rights vis-a-vis -vis China, but also Russia and North Stream, if you could weigh in on that, I, that would be great. Sure, thank you, Suda, and also thank you for the invitation. And um, I would maybe start with China because Francisca just um, um, they maybe finished with that point, and then I'll I'll try to come to Nord Stream two and uh, and Russia. So on our party convention, definitely we had a discussion because obviously also in our within our party membership. Um, opinions go not just one way, but there are people who, who would have liked the uh, our, our party to be um, even more concrete than we were. I think it's it's um, it was a compromise that we talked about before and had a little debate, even though our convention was uh, only digital. Um, I think that was um, that was also part of the debate that could have been different when you are in one room, when you can talk to each other, but that's how the pandemic goes. So um, I think um, we always need, and that's what the FDP has always been very outspoken about. We have to combine the thought of and the and the protection of universal human rights in the world with um, a freedom of economy or a free market and a free trade principle. Um, but as Francisca also found, pointed out, and I'm with her on that, is um, we, we need to think about, are we able or are we wanting to pay, to, to pay a price um, in the very short run um, when it comes to maybe setting a few steps into um, diversification in economics and um, maybe also getting getting some other countries in Asia involved in our cooperation, in our economic cooperation, that in, in my opinion, um, will lead the way to a more long run uh, decision-making process. Um, so economics and human rights go hand in hand, but I think we should come or get over our um, thoughts of that we are the ones that are dependent on China. This goes vice versa. This is not a one-way street. And um, the, the comprehensive agreement on investment is just one example on that. And I would strongly um, advise the next government in Germany to um, directly stay in contact also with our transatlantic friends, with our American friends, because um, what we had as a decision-making in process when it comes to the uh, the the Kai uh, last year, I think it was um, not the right signal to the um, well the Biden administration that took over in January that the the Kai was actually put in place and now is taken back um, well I'm, well fortunately taken back uh, so far as long we as we don't have a level playing field and I'm not seeing that at the moment. Um, when it comes to Russia, also the Free Democrats have always been outspoken about the whole process and that the German government um, didn't so much take into account that European partners strongly opposed the um, Nord Stream 2 project. And I would 
also advise uh, the next government to think about that. And as we still don't see drastic consequences for um, the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin, when it comes to the annexation of Crimea, when it comes to um, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, um, the drastic human rights abuses and violations in Russia all over the country, I think Nord Stream 2 could be a, a momentum where we could say we need to have a moratorium for the time being, as long as we don't see consequences. And so far, the Kremlin is not um, dealing with um, the, the poisoning, is not dealing and is rejecting any kind of uh, debate in the Council of Europe. Maybe Andreas will talk about that, that a little. So um, I think we need to be more outspoken about the values that we share, especially with our transatlantic friends. Gita, if I could just interject, because there is one question in the Q&A that sort of relates, especially since many voters of the FDP are you know, some people from the business community in Germany. Do you think FDP voters that are um, you know, active, in, um, active in business, how do you think they feel about the sanctions? And do they think the Nord Stream 2 um, project should be stopped? What are you telling your voters about this topic? Well, so far, I haven't met any business woman or men that have told me we do not care about values um, based um, cooperation. And so I would say the, the FDP is not opposing free trade, but we are opposing no consequences for rule breaking and no consequences for infringing on international law. And that's why we um, proposed this moratorium and not just um, tearing out of the project as such. But if we look into the future, I would, I would favor um, decision-making processes also on the political level when it's not only an economic decision. And I think the government sometimes, or especially the chancellor, always try to get her head around, it is only an economic project. So please just um, accept this. And I think um, this is not how, how business men and women think. And this is not how they think in China as well. They are very concerned when we talk about the human rights abuses and also um, their responsibility that they feel that they share in this whole process. So um, it's not black and white, it's obviously gray, but um, I think that we're, we are very steady on, on, on that situation and position. Thank you. Um, Andreas, your uh, chancellor candidate, Armin Laschet, gave a um, speech today with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. So I'm definitely gonna talk about that with you a little later on, but what are your thoughts when it comes to the sanctions? Um, what do you think the calculation is on the part of the Biden administration? As I said, Neil said more time, but there's probably an expectation as well, right? What do you think the administration wants in return? And um, also about China, was that sort of a debacle for Merkel to push for this agreement when there's a lot of um, there's 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 a lot of um, there's not support for it all over Europe and that looks doesn't look like um, Brussels is all for it either. Well, let me let me first remark that I think uh, we we uh, very much appreciate I think that the U.S. administration is uh, pursuing a cooperative uh, strategy. I think this is in very much in line with what Anthony Blinken wrote in his analysis over 30 years ago that uh, sanctions against an ally are not a smart idea. Uh, uh, we acknowledge that there, the administration has some uh, uh, controversy and some trouble uh, with Congress uh, uh, in this context. Uh, I think the perspective in my party on the Nord Stream project was always quite mixed. I think we see some economic benefits, we see some geopolitical uh, implications, but we have to look at it realistically and pragmatically given where we are. We are not at the start of this project. It is just uh, short of completion. It has all legal permits in place. So terminating it by a political decision now would come at a very high cost to everybody. And I don't see anyone inclined to pay billions of dollars of uh, in indemnities uh, to Gazprom or, or anyone else. When we look forward together um, uh, across the Atlantic and in Europe, uh, and we come to a, a joint reassessment of how we want to deal with our energy relationship with Russia. Uh, I think there we can work towards common ground, but 
what is difficult for Germany to accept is to be singled out with a particular project in this context. Uh, as long as the United States buys uh, crude oil from Russia for billions of dollars every year and makes no uh, signs that they will that they will walk back from that, it will be difficult to explain uh, to the German electorate why why Germany should be singled out in not having an energy relationship with Russia. But I think we will be working towards common ground on that, and I think the same is true for China. I think uh, uh, we again here we need to be firmly anchored in our principles and values, but also realistic and pragmatic. I see a lot of convergence uh, under the new administration between uh, European and US perspectives. It's, I think nobody talks about decoupling anymore. This was a, an unrealistic and, and, and uh, ill-guided concept from in the first place. But if uh, the US administration talks about cooperate, compete, confront uh, with China and uh, European uh, terminology is that we see China as, at the same time as a partner, a competitor and a systemic rival. I think there's a lot of room for convergence. We may have nuances uh, where we uh, uh, conclude on this in detail, but as we approach it with a common perspective, uh, I think we will be able uh, to pursue a joint strategy uh, between the United States and Germany going forward. Sorry, I have no sound. Thank you, Andreas. <laughs> I am going to um, go to Niels and I'm gonna start looking at the questions that our audience is posed in the Q&A box because Niels has to leave at six o'clock our time. So Niels, why don't you take uh, this one question from Marius regarding Russia. What is the status of Russia in the German political and military strategy? Is Russia an ally, friend, competitor for Germany? Um, how do you think about Russia as a NATO member? And then the second question um, from a Stephen Jakstadt about the future of transatlantic relations, specifically the future of German-American relations. What do you see as the topics for the future when it comes to the bilateral relationship? If you can take those two questions. I, I try and thanks for, for the questions and the interest. Look, I, I think unfortunately right now we are maybe at a all time low in the German-Russian relations. There are many reasons. Uh, some has, have already been mentioned, and it gives me also an opportunity to underline that um, it's far from having no consequences what Russia is doing. I mean, we impose sanctions um, when it comes to the uh, annexation of Crimea. We did the same uh, uh, because of Russia's malign activities in eastern Ukraine. And, you know, Suda, when we started designing that kind of um, sanctions and, and the policy packages, we did that in close cooperation with the United States. And also our sanctions regime somehow has been in sync, has been product of a, a close transatlantic cooperation. That has been lost on the, under the Trump administration. And that's very unfortunate. And I hope um, that in spite of the fact that Russia seems to be still the polarizing issue and partisan issue in the domestic debate in the United States, which is having an effect of US administrations uh, to run um, their Russia policies, but I believe we, we have, have a better opportunity for common ground. Uh, for us, Russia right now is certainly um, a real challenge. That's why also sometimes it's a little overlooked what Germany has been doing in terms of, for example, forward deployment of German troops on a rotating base. I just yesterday was in a call with our Baltic friends. We do the air policing and, and much more very high readiness joint task force. And also with respect to what my colleagues said about Nord Stream 2, we can disagree about Nord Stream 2, that's fine with me, but we should not you know, um, overlook our own interest. And we should also not always by everything that has been said. There is no country more engaged in supporting Ukraine than Germany. And uh, we are taking the security interests of our neighbors and our Ukrainian friends, not only into consideration, but without Merkel negotiating and, and, and the foreign office negotiating, uh, the gas transfer would not be in existence today the agreement between Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, um, up to uh, unconditional credits, which because of the lack of reform projects sometimes then are not going to be implemented. There's so much that we are doing. And I regret sometimes that, you know, 
there's a position being painted. And sometimes this all due respect to my colleagues here on some of my colleagues on the panel also being repeated uh, by a German uh, rhetoric that that's not helping us in that in that situation. So um, I think um, that all that I said about Russia, we still understand that Russia is a factor in our security. It's not going to go away. And that's why we always try to increase the pressure, but at the same time maintain a way of talking to them and engaging them as a European and also a regional power. And I think that's a, that's a challenge that, that will, um, will, will be maintained and it, it's very difficult. But if I can sort of just one remark, you know, in the, to, at the height of the Cold War, the coal administration completed um, a, a, a gas deal with the then Soviet Union. And so these are questions that are go beyond um, the, the current disputes that we have. And I think it's important um, to be able to decompartmentalize a little bit. And that's not always easy, but that's what we are trying to do. Niels, before you get to the question um, about the future of the German-American relationship, I, before you go, I have to ask you about 2% and NATO, because you mentioned NATO and working with partners. And you, know, you talked about the coal administration, also West Germany, at that time had a large army and a considerable uh, military budget. How is, what is the SPD stance on the 2% for NATO and the Wales commitment? No, oh, um, it's a good coincidence Suda, because um, our candidate vice chancellor, um, uh, Olaf Scholz was in the uh, question time of the German parliament today. And he, he without uh, any doubt defended uh, the German and the SPD's policy uh, by the way, um, to increase, substantially increase funding for the German armed forces. And, you know, I don't want to, to, <laughs> to convert this into a, uh, into a partisan <laughs> platform, but it was a social democratic finance minister that made that increase in funding possible. And that's not because we have been pressured by Trump or whoever, but because we believe it's necessary. Um, and, and so uh, I, I, I'm rather confident that whatever the next government would look like, uh, Germany's commitment to NATO in terms of the political commitment is unwavering, but you will see also it will be, um, will be underlined by an increased investment in our armed forces. We just um, signed an agreement with NATO for a new um, NATO um, headquarters in Ulm that has been uh, come public. So uh, we do the forward presence, the air policing. So, and uh, my minister Heiko Maas initiated what essentially has been, I think, a very productive report on the political pillar of NATO, um, where um, uh, our former defense minister and uh, Thomas de Maizière uh, made a very significant contribution. So I think, you know, there will be a discussion about 2% in the election campaign coming up, but um, friends from abroad may be watching us here have no reason uh, to be con concerned about Germany's unwavering commitment to NATO. Okay, and then last 60 seconds, if President Biden meets with Chancellor Merkel before the election, what are the three topics that need to be discussed? I think uh, we already discussed about two of the topics, uh, Russia and China, for sure. Uh, what we just had uh, John Kerry here in Berlin, I think he also heard talks uh, with many of my, my colleagues in the Bundestag and we are really making progress. Uh, uh, and so I think also the international climate diplomacy, especially now after the, the new push that also is going to come from our new legislation will be top on the agenda and health issues, uh, Suda, which uh, for obvious reasons need to be addressed. Also some of the proposals of the Biden administration, which I think um, in a more general term is very positive, but they're, uh, they're important details to make sure that COVAX will become a real success and we need to speed up um, as that process for sure. So I'm not the spokesperson of the chancellor, but I'm pretty confident that- Well, you're in the same government the still. So <laughs> <laughs> Niels, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Auf Wiedersehen. And, thank uh, we'll you and thank you for your understanding also to my thing. colleagues that they, they are so patient. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, thank Niels. You. See you. Bye-bye. So I'd like to move on now to questions pertaining to Europe, and I'm going to group some of the questions in the inbox, and I'd like to maybe call on Francisca and Gita for some of these questions. One is a question about 
um, about Brexit. You know, what should, you know, it's, it, what's going to be the future relationship with uh, Great Britain? Maybe Francisca, you can take that question. And also, um, Gita, I'd like, and also Francisca, while we're also your, your, your views on Europe and this whole question of strategic autonomy, um, what sort of role should Germany have within Europe? considering the European Union is a pillar of German foreign policy. And Gita, I'd like to also talk to you about or ask you uh, to weigh in about the topic of debt, mutual debt, uh, because of the corona crisis, um, a step was taken to collectivize debt because of this economic crisis. What is the FDP's uh, position on further um, integration, on uh, uh, economic integration within Europe? So Francisca, why don't we go to you first and then Gita will go to you. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Uh, but Suda, important uh, difference, we did not collectivize any debt in the EU. Uh, the EU as such is taking on debts now. It's a very, very significant difference um, because otherwise, you know, uh, we would have a very different debate in Germany and the FDP would not have voted in favor. <laughs> so I think it's um, really, it's a, quite a significant um, distinction. Um, and it's a temporary um, and, vehicle yeah, as but well, even right? the I think it's really, you know, it's not that Germany is now rely, uh, liable for Italian debt or whatsoever, but the from the e, the EU budget has been now the basis to go to the financial markets, um, and the EU budget will have to pay it back, and then Germany its share, Italy its share, etc. But it's a very distinct mechanism, um, and I, by the way, think that we should. Uh, prolong it in a way that we, for our next crisis, we can activate it again. So sort of uh, a standby mechanism for crisis that we uh, don't get every time in a position to be blackmailed by Mr. Orban, um, because we need his yes. Um, that's, you know, our main point, because it was painful to see that Orban could say, you know, it, I can block all of this uh, if you will watch what we do on the rule of law and democracy back home. Um, but I think it's part of the discussion of where we want to take Europe. Uh, you know, if you talk about strategic sovereignty, I don't like the word autonomy because autonomy sounds like you want to close yourself up from the rest and become completely independent. It's not at all my vision of Europe. Um, for me, the vision is that we have a capacity to achieve the goals we define together as Europeans and that we become more resilient in an interdependent world. And I say in an interdependent world where we wanna remain, we don't wanna you know, cut um, our ties, but we wanna become more resilient and have more capacity to act. And for that, for example, the question of resilience in crisis and capacity to act rapidly, I think is key. Um, the second one on, uh, on Brexit, you know, I, I thought it was a real shame that Johnson did not want to negotiate at all anything with the EU on foreign and security and defense matters, not even on foreign policy, not even on neighborhood policy, not even on the Balkans, uh, nothing, zero, he, not one minute that was spent in negotiations on it. And that he even refuses to give uh, the European Union an embassy in London, etc., because he sort of tries to do as if the EU doesn't exist. Um, and I think, you know, that's not a good way forward. Um, and that Germany should not do the mistake to now build up a bilateral relationship on foreign security policy, because that will divide the EU, but that we have to do it as Europeans. And just, you know, Johnson has to face the reality that the EU exists, even if the UK left it. Um, so I'm, you know, very skeptical of um, having uh, a bilateral relationship while Johnson blocking any recognition of the EU as an external actor. Um, there will have to be new formats, uh, but never Germany alone. I think it should always be others, the EU institutions as part of it. Um, and I hope that, you know, relationships will be better. And I, as the question was in the chat also on the North Ireland protocol, I really think that you must insist on implementing it. Because if you don't insist on implementing the rules at the beginning, it won't be possible to do it later on other topics. Uh, and I think, you know, the UK is a country that should follow up on the treaties uh, they have signed. 
Gita, let's talk a little bit about the issue of um, mutual debt. I, it seems like the FDP is probably um, not in favor of it, if you could talk a little bit about that. But I also want to get to one other question in the chat from Rachel Rizzo of CNAS, because it relates about Germany um, coming to terms with the fact is that it's the engine of Europe and it, it is a great power. Do you agree with that statement? Um, do you think Germany is a great power? And if so, what do you think it needs to do to live up to that responsibility? And um, Andreas, you can totally pick up on that question as well. So regarding the first question, uh, no, we're not. Um, but I think maybe on the more but you have Let's voted all in favor, Gide. I'm like, you know. We we did, but but you explained why we did, and I think that's the importance to to the whole debate. Um, of course, also there we have colleagues that say, well, still we need to face certain issues such as such as this pandemic together, and I think Europe only needs to or Europe needs to become stronger, and it is not in our interest in Germany and also not in the interest of the FDP um, that we're we're not able to, to face these crises together. I think if we talk about um, uh, projects that we face together in Europe, it should and solidarity, it should not only and directly um, go to the question who pays for it and on, on, on the question of solidarity means paying and having having financial means into into it because for for my generation for the generation of my daughter for example maybe Europe means something totally different and that is standing together um, behind certain values that we uh, need to cherish more and that's why I think we need to change certain decision making processes in in Europe and that is not only a question on on, on, on the on the debt is, issue, I think um, the the FDP has always pointed out that it's important to get this debate into the German Bundestag. Um, I'm totally fine with that, but I, I'd like to come to these decision making process in Brussels. And um, I'm again with Francisca when she says uh, we need a common and joint uh, EU voice when it comes to um, reacting to China to uh, the um, international breaking breaking the international law by China. Um, also, when it comes to uh, to dealing with Great Britain and and, and joining in certain projects um, and for making these uh, decisions, we see and we just saw it uh, yesterday that uh, that uh, Hungary blocked a joint resolution on Israel. Um, we need we need other decision-making processes for that. We need qualified voting and not this consensus, but that is the, I think we all share that interest um, that we need to be more agile, more, more effective and more faster in our, in our reactions. But still, if we have um, these country or these countries sitting together at the table and one or two uh, are always finding arguments why they don't want to be part of it. We need to maybe need more of these of these councils of, of getting together. And I think the pandemic has shown, I'm sorry that I always come back to the pandemic, but it has shown so much how important uh, diplomacy is, how important getting together and looking into each other's eyes is. And this is where I think um, the second question comes in. Um, Germany is um, an important actor within the, the European Union. Sometimes I think we could be more confident to voice our concerns, our ideas, our, our um, sense of the future of the European Union and shouldn't be so, so timid. Um, and still uh, we need to, to check back with our friends and not only France, but also with Eastern European countries so that they know and that we can, we can adjust with them that they have the same seat at the table as we have and that we are not something more important. I think that is important for getting these diplomacies back together. And also for, for trying to make the best out of uh, President Orban. Um, I think we need to deal with him, that's, that's how it is. Um, I wanted to say something else. I just forgot and I forgot to write it down. Maybe okay. it comes we'll back. To Andreas, very sorry. Quickly, and maybe the thought will Perfect. come back. Thank you. Andreas, if you could talk a little bit about um, 
German responsibility, what that means in a post-Merkel era. And there's another question in the chat from Rob Fenstermacher from the ACG about how to reinvigorate the transatlantic relationship. Maybe those two questions sort of- Which go relationship? Sorry, I didn't get, I didn't um, get the last How one. can um, the re transatlantic relationship be okay. reinvigorated? I think for us, it has always been clear that uh, Germany can only prosper as long as it is firmly anchored in the, in the European Union and, and in NATO. Uh, this provides for international stability and security and is also the prerequisite for our economic strengths. Uh, we want to be a credible partner in all dimensions uh, in Europe and across the Atlantic, uh, both economic, financial, but also in terms of providing security. We are entering an era where, uh, not because we have changed, but the world around us is, is changing quite dramatically. Uh, the US will refocus uh, its attention mainly on other parts of the globe. We will be expected in Europe uh, to provide uh, more for our own security and for stability in our immediate neighborhood. I think this will require not only uh, harsh rhetoric as uh, it is uh, in ample supply from our, my friends from the opposition parties, but we will always have to, to beef this up with uh, hard capabilities, both economically and in security terms. We have done a lot uh, with our French partners in the, under the EU umbrella with PESCO, uh, with strengthening uh, um, technology projects, uh, but also uh, looking at uh, stronger approaches to project uh, uh, power uh, in our immediate uh, neighborhood. And I think this will, this will come with a lot of responsibility. This will be demanding also in terms of our investment in security, in hard security capabilities. And I think this is where we have to put uh, our action uh, uh, where our rhetoric is. Uh, I, I hear a lot of strong um, uh, verbal statements against Russia or China, but when it comes We're to- We're not yet in government, Andreas. We cannot act. Well, up to you. <laughs> when, it, when it comes to back up, well, Francisca, I can agree a lot with you probably, but with, with many others in your party, uh, you argue for unilateral nuclear disarmament. Uh, we have, unless you are in a coalition with us, uh, there will be no uh, nuclear uh, 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 sharing with the United States anymore and a, and, a, and a difficult decoupling from security links with NATO. This, I think, has to, and this will be part of the substance what we will have to discuss. Uh, we need to invest more in technology, also in None of us intelligence and, and, and other aspects. Uh, and and uh, it, is, it, is, it is one of the inviting challenges if you want to move from opposition to government to, to put your actions where your rhetoric is. Andreas, in our program, it says nowhere unilaterally. It says that we have to do this with our European and transatlantic partners. But yes, we believe in a nuclear free world. And we think that every nuclear well, bomb less is one that makes the world safer. But in our program, it specifically says. To well, I've it. I've been in the debates in Parliament where your colleagues have argued for signing to the to the abolition uh, a treaty uh, for and for unilateral disarmament in Europe. So maybe we have some stuff to clarify among yourselves before we go into a coalition. Uh, but we will uh, we we will we will see. I think what is important as we go forward that that also with our electorate we need to have an honest debate that we cannot take a lot of what is around us for granted that we will have to have more investment in our economic strengths, but also into our uh, security. And this is thing, uh, are some of the key dimensions for which we need more European commitment, more European uh, investment, uh, but also uh, uh, invigorating the transatlantic relationship. And as I mentioned before, with this president, with this uh, secretary of state, uh, with this majority, I think we look uh, eye to eye on many issues and uh, we will have a much better basis uh, for division of labor and cooperation uh, uh, in a number of issues in security and beyond, uh, not, not least uh, climate foreign policy uh, as we tackle the challenges for the 21st century. So we're pretty much out of time and I didn't get to many of the questions in the Q&A box. We'll have to have a part two, but it was also good to see a little bit of the election rhetoric <laughs> taking place already in the panel. Obviously it is an election year in Germany, but maybe I'll end with just a quick um, lightning round for the three of our panelists, um, combining some of the topics in the chat. Um, do you think EU enlargement should happen? This is a question from Ambassador Kreft. And um, the second question is, if you look at Washington and if you look at Brussels, the next government, what are gonna be the main, like? maybe name two or three topics that have to be um, at the top of the agenda. Very quickly, please, um, since we're out of time. Francisca, we'll go in alphabetical order again. 
we have been uh, proponents of enlargement also to the in the western balkans of course based on rule of law etc but we think that it's terrible that now bulgaria is blocking it um, after we solved it with uh, greece um, and we think that there needs to be much more political pressure to overcome this um, blockade uh, on the second point what should be on the agenda climate 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 um, health and then i think the big third topic is saving our liberal democracies within and from outside and i think to really really re-strengthen that that means you know how do we regulate uh, internet social media platforms etc i think we have a joint joint big big project um if we want to save our liberal democracies and i think that's sort of the basis for all the rest agita and andreas would you agree anything missing from that list well, I would have said maybe in another order, but I would have said um, defending our uh, Western, not not geographically speaking, but our Western um, multilateral way of life, um, defending democracy, because the list of countries that are democratic and also pacing for democracy is going down. Um, also climate, definitely, and, um, and, and the situation of solving um, global crises together um, and maybe on uh, on on the EU integration, I would I would definitely say um, it needs to be possible for other countries to join the European Union, also with different paces, uh, if possible. But there need to be certain red lines that um, need to be um, not overstepped. And if that is the case, we can talk about everything, and nobody should be excluded or feel excluded. I think that's important. Andreas, Armin Laschet proposed in his speech uh, that Germany should have a national security council. Do you think um, the list that Francisca and the topics that Gita mentioned will be um, issues for this security council to consider? Are there any more? I think this is something that I've been arguing for a couple of years for. I think it is something that, that uh, reflects our increased uh, responsibility and our ability to define our, our strategic priorities and project uh, stability also into our neighborhood. Uh, whether uh, EU enlargement is the only uh, strategy in this regard, I'm a bit skeptical. I think this may be true for the Western Balkans. I think for countries like Ukraine or Turkey and others, we will find uh, different institutional setups uh, as we have in the Council of Europe on the rule of law, but maybe also uh, in, in, in learning from the uh, Great Britain structure of how a country can be closely affiliated to the European Union without being a full member. But this, but the key aspect that I see is to, to make sure that we invest for, the, for our economic capability on a European level. The EU may have a 10 or 15 year window where it can still punch above its weight as an economic actor in the world, we need to make sure we, we, we use that time, we expand on our capabilities to become a geoeconomic and a geopolitical actor that can argue uh, forcefully for its values and its interests uh, in, in a changing world uh, as we have discussed it. Thank you very much, uh, Gida, Francisca, and Andreas. Thank you all for tuning in. We're gonna have another event next week about uh, foreign policy again, but this time views from the outside with Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill and also member of the EU Parliament, Radek of Sokorsky. So hope you can join us then. Um, in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your evenings and a good morning to all of you or the rest of the good morning for all of you across the Atlantic. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.